All right. Hoops Talk Weekly, episode number two. Very excited to uh, have a good friend of mine on. Uh, a man that needs no introduction. Um, I mentioned this before. I'm going to try to do this on a weekly basis, try to find people that I find, um, obviously, their affiliation with the Lakers, somebody that I find interesting, and somebody that's just grinding in the industry, uh, Mr. Trevor Lane himself from Lakers Nation. Uh, welcome, Trevor Lane. Welcome, Trevor Lane. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, and being your first guest, it's it's an honor. Okay, listen, this is actually kind of the, the funny thing here. So I've had the channel, obviously, for a long time. You and I have talked on the radio 180 times. We I've come on Lakers Nation. For some yep. reason, I haven't, you know, I haven't really had guests on my YouTube. So it's something that I'll um, work on doing a little bit more. But um, for those who are uh, tuning in right now, uh, just do me a favor. Just get off your chair, stand up, give Trevor Lane a standing go. He deserves a standing <laughs> go. Um, and let's take it from there. Well, I, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on. So uh, for those, just to give everybody kind of just a, a little bit of an idea of what um, today's episode is going to be about, we're going to talk Lakers basketball. Don't worry. Um, Trevor and I have plenty to bitch and complain about. We're, we're really good at that. It's one of our strengths here is complaining about the Lakers. But on top of that, um, part of the idea and the concept is also to talk to Trevor Lane about kind of his story, how he got into the his role at Lakers Nation. There's a lot that Trevor, there's a lot I don't know about you, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I feel like I got a lot to learn uh, today as well. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, let, let's let's start with this, Trev. Where'd you grow up? Give us kind of your background. Where did you grow up? Was it specifically in Los Angeles? Was it somewhere else? Let 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 the people know. Sure. So I, I grew up in in Mission Viejo, which is in uh, in Orange County in Southern California. Um, I, I grew up there. Great little place to live. Obviously, the whole area has grown like crazy since I was a kid a long, long, long time ago. Um, but I, I grew up there and uh, grew up. You know, right, not that far away from from Los Angeles. Obviously, Orange County can be a bit of a different world than L.A. But uh, but yeah, that was where I, I grew up and a great little place to live. Went to Mission Viejo High School, all that all that kind of stuff. So that's that's where I'm from originally. And uh, and that's a good chunk of, you know, the root of my Lakers fandom is is growing up so close to the team. OK, what what drew you to Lakers basketball? Because I, I know for me and I, I think. This is what's most interesting for me on YouTube. Yes, you got definitely got people who are born and raised in L.A., but you also got Laker fans are everywhere. And, and I know you know this because you're interacting with Laker fans a lot. The Lakers are a brand that it's one of the few brands that it's not it's not um, locale and where you're from does not mean that you're a Laker fan, right? That there's a few franchises out there. You might have the Dallas Cowboys, maybe the sure. Yankees, if you want to say, right? Now I'm sure the Dodgers to another level because of their international um, stardom with going to get Otani and uh, Yamamoto. But I, I, I'm always kind of curious, okay, well, why the Lakers? What what got you into Lakers basketball? So my, I think it's as simple as this. It's it's a generational thing for me, for my family. My dad was a Lakers fan. And going back, the earliest memory I have is actually of watching the Lakers, watching the Showtime Lakers, Magic and Kareem, uh, hanging out in my, my living room with my dad. And as a kid, trying to do Kareem's sky hook on my little play school hoop. That's that's as far back as my memory goes at this point. So it's, it's always something that's been there. It's mostly because you know my dad was a Lakers fan so I grew up watching Lakers basketball listening to Chick Hearn and Stu Lance doing the the play by play putting putting Chick on the radio so you could hear his his call of the game while you're watching it on TV um that was how I grew up so it's a it's a generational thing in my family and and that's how that was my introduction from the Lakers it's it's always been a thing since I was a kid how was your form on your skyhook are you still working on it like where are you today on your skyhook <laughs> oh it's awful it's awful, Alan. If you and I, if you and I ever actually play, you'll you'll see that um, it, it is, it, it was terrible. I never developed the uh, the sky hook. I never had the requisite height for it either. I was missing the sky part of the sky hook, um, so that that just never never came to fruition. Yeah, I don't know if we're ever gonna play one on one. Even though <laughs> we went through a phase, yeah, we went through a phase where I think every live stream that I did, somebody would ask, "Hey, when are you gonna go one on one with Trevor?" Yeah. 
And I don't know where it started, but I just fed into it. I haven't got them recently, but if we do get out there, bro, if you came out of nowhere with a sky hook, that'd be amazing. <laughs> that would be just incredible if you came out with a sky hook. You know, it's funny you say that, that, um, you know, your dad was a Laker fan, so that was passed on to you. My Laker fandom is so random. It's, it's so random. You know, growing up in San Diego, um, I wasn't even really into sports. And I don't know if I had I, – I had a cousin of mine that was like a quasi-Laker fan. And that just kind of introduced me to basketball. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me more about this. And I started seeing magic. And I'm like, what the hell is magic? I remember a long, long time ago. I'm probably seven, eight years old. Uh, no, probably a little bit older than that. But my mom had given me 20 bucks and she's like, okay, hey, you're going to be at the mall. Go ahead, buy something at the mall that you want to buy. And I bought this VHS of Magic Johnson. And I think it was always Showtime. I forget what it was called. And you could probably go online and you could see it. I'm just watching these highlights of Magic. I'm like, this is the greatest specimen I've ever seen of an athlete. What the hell am I watching? But I didn't, I didn't even get to the... The Showtime era, I don't know how much you got to enjoy the Showtime era. Kareem, Magic, Worthy, all that. I didn't, re that, that was too early for me. I didn't really start watching the Lakers until Kareem was done. And uh, it, it's more of the iconic shots of Magic throwing the ball against the Portland Trailblazers to the other side of the hoop and saying the game is done, the game's done. I think it was before they played the Chicago Bulls. Mm -hmm. But I, I do find it interesting when somebody became a Laker fan because everybody's got obviously a different and unique story. Yeah, that's funny. You know, you're you you reminds me of back in the day when you could just get dropped off at the mall because malls were a thing that people went to and yeah. and it was no big deal. You get dropped off at the mall, you use the pay phone to call your parents to come pick you up and um and all of that. Yeah, that was a that was a, a different era for sure. Um, my first game that I actually attended that I went to was in 1987, I believe. Um, and that was, oh, wow. And that was, um, Charles Barkley got ejected from that game for throwing an elbow. And I was just a, a little kid at that point, but, uh, but yeah, it was the Lakers against the 76ers and Charles Barkley got ejected for throwing an elbow. And my parents will still tell me like that. I was, I was yelling stuff at Barkley and excited that he I got kicked it. out of the game. Yeah, and, I believe it. You know, yeah. So, I could see you cursing, flipping him off on I'm his sure. way out. Like little, in the little tunnel. Five year old me was, was probably going crazy. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. I, I, you know, I never got a chance to go to the great Western form growing up in San Diego. Um, we always had, so the, the sports arena down in San Diego, which unfortunately still exists today, sports <laughs> arena down in San Diego, the Lakers would play one road game a year. Uh, I'm sorry, not a road game. They play one preseason game a year down in SD. So I would always, you know, tell my parents that hey, we got to get to this one game, got to get to this one game. Um, and that was the only time that I'd really get to see them is at, at the sports arena preseason game. And I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. I mean, I was probably like you, I would wait till I'd force my parents to wait till chicken stew were done with the post game. So I could say hi to them. And I don't know oh, yeah. why I thought that was like the greatest thing ever. And now I should tell Stu Lance's story. I run into Stu, you know, basically every home game and Stu is the nicest guy out there. I I was going to say, so So that was my, from having met Stu as well, isn't he, like, growing up listening to him, isn't he exactly the way you thought thousand he percent, thousand percent. It's amazing. thousand percent. Like, whatever you heard him on a radio. And I listen, yeah. we also have this, uh, the, the, the different formats that we have today. I know we got a lot of a younger audience, too, that are just Laker fans that want to consume it. They probably know what the hell we're talking about when we're saying, you know, we would just sit there and listen to a radio we are aging ourselves here but it is what it is that's how we used to do it um but well, it Stu, used to be it was, it was simulcast and so you couldn't hear chick hearn and Stu lance or it was chick hearn and another guy for a little bit but it, you couldn't hear them uh on the tv broadcast if it was the nationally televised game so you'd have to turn down the volume on the tv and turn up your radio so you could listen to chick and Stu call it exactly that's yeah. exactly how it was um but i always found that you know i always find that funny um, first time I actually ever went to first, first time I ever went to, so I, I had never been to, um, the great Western forum, at least to watch a Lakers game. First time I ever went to Staples center Lakers won 
let's see, what was their what was their string of championships here? Pacers were the first one with Kobe and Shaq. Yeah, that was in two thousand. So they went okay. two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two. It was Nets the following year or Philly? Yeah, it uh, no, it was Philly. It, it was it was uh, Philly. It was Pacers, uh, Philly, and then Nets. And then Nets. So first time I'd ever gone. You know how they do this? They would open up Staples Center for a road game. And they would allow oh, yeah. fans to come in and just watch the game from a jumbotron. It's the first time I got a chance to to watch it um, at Staples Center, um, and that was really. It's kind of funny. The era of the Showtime era for me doesn't really do anything for me. My era was Nick Van Exel, Eddie Jones, mm -hmm. Eldon Campbell, Cedric Sabas. It was that era, and then obviously we got Sha Shaq and Kobe after that. So we we got pretty fortunate to finally start watching some championships starting in two thousand. Yeah, yeah, that was and that was a fun era. I mean, Nick the Quick, Man Exel finding him. Remember before that, it was Sadale Threat. Yep. Uh, Cedric Sabalos getting him, uh, the, and then eventually trading him. But um, Eddie Jones, man, I wish he had stuck around. They I loved Eddie to get, to get Glenn Rice. I wanted Eddie to love Eddie. I thought, he, I thought he and Kobe could have worked together. Um, man, the the Eddie chants they used to come down from the crowd. Best. Was, like, so good. So good. That was that yeah. was a fun era. Even when the Lakers weren't, they were just they were just kind of a playoff team, but not really a contender at that point or anything. Um, that was that was a fun team. That was a fun. Looking back, there's that was a fun team. Um, to, to every watch every, every once in a while, um, Lakers will put out. You know, maybe they'll put out on Instagram or Twitter or whatever the case is, and it's just this highlight reel of Nick Van Exel, and I'll yeah. just stop. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and watch all four minutes of this. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch Nick the Quick when he used to play. But that was, you're right. It was a fun era of basketball. And uh, I think for a lot of us, uh, depending on what era you were in, but that was kind of my specific era right there. Um, okay. Got a quick question for you. Where'd you go to yeah. school? What'd you study? Um, what was your, uh, what, what, what is your degree in? So I went to, uh, I first went to Saddleback College as a junior college to get my first couple of years done. Uh, my gen ed stuff in, in college done, um, which was the, the cheaper route to go, which uh, ended up working out for me. Uh, then I went to Concordia University in Irvine uh, to finish my, my last couple of years. And then I also got a, a teaching credential. My degree is in history and political science, which makes a ton of sense with what, with what I'm doing now. Um, but uh, I got a degree in, in history and political science and then, uh, and then got a, a teaching credential. And it's actually worked out better than it would appear to on the surface because uh, I was a teacher for 13 years after after mm. college. I went and got a, a teaching job. I actually taught out in Arizona for uh, for 13 years. Uh, there was a little break in the middle there, but uh, but I taught for 13 years junior high history, and a lot of the stuff that I picked up just in terms of teaching and being in front of 30 plus kids six times mm. a day every you know every single day. Uh, a lot of things in terms of presenting material have actually translated over. And then I think what's really helped too with having a, a history degree is while there isn't a direct link to sports necessarily, we did a lot of, of learning how to analyze the big picture on things and, and really try to put things into context historically. And so I think that's part of why when people are listening to, to our content over at Lakers nation, they're watching the show, they notice that and sometimes they get frustrated with me for not, riding the roller coaster as much, not getting quite as upset when the Lakers lose or, or anything because I tend to take a step back and look at the big picture of things rather than live game by game. I still feel it game by game. Don't get me wrong. The Lakers losing to the Nets was an absolute crusher, but I think because I've spent so much time thinking from a historical perspective and looking at kind of the big picture concept, that's actually helped having the, my, uh, my degree in history with, uh, with this sports analysis that I'm now doing. So you taught for 13 years? Yeah. You were a teacher for yeah. 13 years? Yeah, I taught for 13 years. I taught uh, junior high school history. Uh, I taught a, like a careers course and things like that as well. And then I coached everything, man. I coached I coached basketball. I coached soccer. I coached volleyball. I coached track and field. I coached football. Um, all kinds of stuff that I was mm. coaching. So I was constantly coaching after school every single day um, and, uh, and was teaching. So did that for uh, did that for a long time. And that was... I, that was a lot of fun. It there were some tough times too. There were some, some some days where I was like, "Oh my gosh, these kids!" But but for the most part, I've got some really fond memories of uh, of teaching too. Okay, wh when did you stop? Um, when did you stop teaching? 
Ah, uh, the pandemic actually was when I when I stopped, and there was a, a few reasons. Um, you know, for one, I I had started to really consider leaving teaching, probably about a year before. Okay, where I start, I hit a point, Alan, where, um, you know, I had grown like Lakers Nation. The podcast had grown, and the YouTube channel was starting to get going, and and all of that, and that I had started thinking, you know, man, if I instead of just doing this. After I get home, after my daughter's in bed and hmm. things like that, like what if I could really commit to this and just sure. and just do it? Is that something I would want to do? And I had a steady job teaching. I knew that if I wanted to stay and teach my entire career where I was at, I could do that, uh, which there's some value to that kind of stability. But uh, it was starting to really get to me, you know, like a big news story would break and I'm in the middle of third hour, right, of the day hmm. and there's nothing I can do. There's the, I can't put I can't put out any analysis. I can't do anything on it. Sure. Um, I was I was taking time during lunch, sometimes even between cl- we'd have a four minute passing period. I would record a quick like wow. three minutes on my phone, just audio only and and try to post that and stuff. It um, and that grew more and more frustrating because I felt like I wasn't able to cover the team and to cover the sport the way that I really needed to. So I started considering it. Uh, about a year before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit, um, that was when obviously being, I thought that at the time being in front of 250 plus kids every single day between coaching and teaching, I probably wasn't the best idea during during that time. And my school mm-hmm. was going back. They were pushing to go back and get everybody in person. And, um, and so that just kind of gave me the little extra nudge to really go and try to make a, make a run out of this thing. Um, but again, I'd been feeling it for the last year before that or so that it was probably time to make that move anyway. It was just the pandemic that kind of gave me that extra little push. Like, okay, now's the time to, to go for it. Do you miss that at all? Teaching? Yeah. I, I'll tell you what, I really miss coaching. I miss coaching mm-hmm. a lot. I miss uh, being out on the field with the kids or out on the court with the kids, um, and doing that. And there's times where I definitely miss teaching, but I also feel like with what I do now, I get to kind of scratch sure. that same itch in terms of presenting material, talking about things, going over things, trying to, to uh, you know, convey excitement, trying to trying to go through a shared experience. It's um, there's a lot of similarities. So I do still feel like I scratch that itch. But sure, there are times where, you know, a certain day comes up and I'm like, man, normally I'd be talking about D-Day right now or I'd be talking about this or, or whatever. Um, so there are little time, little things that I miss here and there, but for the most part, um, man, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I, that I made the leap that I did when I did. So I got a lot of Lakers nation questions and, but I, I think that background's important. You know, I think, I, I don't know how many people do at least for maybe for my audience. And I'm, I'm sure my audience is very, very familiar with your work, but you know, sometimes your path of how you get to where you are. Or if there's other people out there that have maybe similar ambitions, right? Maybe what they're doing is um, it's not their favorite thing to do, or maybe it's not the most fulfilling thing to do. And um, the ability today to grab a microphone and kind of give your opinion on things, if you're committed to it, if it's something that you you really want to be a part of your life, it's feasible. It's not, you know, my background... I come from the radio industry. I interned when I was in college in radio. I've been in radio my entire career. I still do radio shows. It's more traditional, but it doesn't have to be that, you know. So I, I think that is kind of a an, an interesting path that you took. You said um, you said you coached and you loved coaching. What um, what were you coaching? Um, I coached a lot of things. So I grew up playing soccer. So I coached Cat. soccer. I coached boys and girls soccer. I also coached basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I grew up playing playing basketball as well. I coached track and field. Skyhook. Um, we know everybody. That's knows. that's right. That's right. Um, I coached track and field. I coached football, and I coached volleyball, which is something that I played in in high school. And oh, was, wow, uh, volleyball is so much fun. Such a fun sport. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I coached all of those things, and um, man, and, and that was that was certainly fun. Getting out there and competing, and and having the you know, just doing something active out there. Because even when you're coaching, you're out there, you're running around, you're doing stuff. You know, it's that was always a great way to end my day. And people always ask, you know, how did you deal with being around all those junior high kids every single day? Part of that is my personality and stuff that tends mm-hmm. to not get to me quite as much. But <laughs> but also that was a great stress relief for me was after at the end of every single day, 
I'm going out there and I'm getting in physical activity. I'm mm -hmm. out there, I'm running with my team, I'm doing all, all that kind of stuff. So I think that that really helped in addition to, you know, it was a good way to supplement income and, and all of that. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I find it uh, when I was in high school and a couple of years in college, too, I just work at a rec center. So in El Cajon, where I grew up, which is about, let's say, 15, 20 minutes east of San Diego, um, the same rec center that I used to play at as a kid, I had basketball. And I always say it, and I talk about it on radio all the time. Some of my favorite years of my life was coaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just this, you know, th these kids are, what the hell do they know what's going on, right? They're just out there after school. I just want to freaking burn off some energy, have a good time, play some competitive sports in the process. But it was flag football and it was, uh, it was basketball. Some of my favorite times. Now, I also became... Basically, anybody wants to play ping pong, I'm going to hustle you, okay? I was at, <laughs> working at a rec center. Uh, there was a lot of ping pong. We were open from 2, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. So when school ended, all the way till 10 p.m. at night, Trev, I got, a lot of, uh, I got a lot of ping pong in. You know, I got a lot of ping pong back in my days. Okay, that's, so. That's good to know. Don't play ping pong for money against Alan Sleeman. All right, good good advice. And that's, that's funny that you used to work at a rec center because that's actually what I did while I was in college. I worked for the YMCA. I ran sports programs for the same YMCA thing. Yeah. while I was in college. Yeah, same thing. I mean, that's funny. Um, you probably were better at it than me, but I just got a lot of, we played half court basically for two hours a day. And then I changed my shirt because I was sweating like crazy, coached the kids for a couple of hours. And then I basically play ping pong and pool from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And eat Not Mexican food. And eat Mexican food. Um, <laughs> okay. So um, I, I think, you know, for me, I, I got curiosity because I don't know. As, as much as you and I have, you know, been in touch over the years, mm -hmm. it's not like we're having a lot of personal conversations. A lot of it just geared towards the Lakers. How did your relationship with Lakers Nation start? What what Can you give us a little bit of background there? Yeah, so while I was teaching, uh, I always knew going in when I first started teaching that uh, I was probably going to need to supplement my income somehow. Teachers you know, are notorious for not making much. And at the same time, I also had kind of a creative itch that I wanted to scratch. I had I was very, very close. I, I had two, I had offers from two schools sitting in front of me. I remember when I was 18. Uh, two routes to, to go. One was a teaching path that would ultimately lead me to the classroom. And another was a path towards uh, towards TV production, which was something that I had done a little bit in high school. And I really enjoyed uh, filming and editing and, and all that sort of stuff. Actually, not on camera stuff, which is weird because that's what I do now. But um, but so I I knew that I had wanted to do something else and I wanted to be something creative. Writing had been something that I had been interested in uh, for a long time. It was part of what I did well on the TV production side was writing scripts mm -hmm. and, uh, and writing was just something that was kind of second nature to me. And so I, I had done some writing in college. I actually wrote about pro wrestling while I was in college uh, for a couple of different websites. So I was already pretty familiar with kind of the online medium. And then I even wrote uh, fantasy basketball for NBA.com for one season <laughs> for mm. one season. And then they kind of folded their fantasy stuff. Uh, but I remember writing about like Gilbert Arenas being a top five player and, and that type of thing. So that's how long ago it was. But um, but then they paid you. They paid you so much you folded the company. That's exactly you what it folded was. Folded the they, fantasy they, company. They, they, they the whole branch not, gone. They could not bear the weight of my enormous contract <laughs> anymore. Um, so I I had tried writing a few novels and things and just hmm. I I thought. I had these great ideas. I had all these characters mapped out. I'd done all this research into novel writing and how to do it and all this kind of stuff. And I kept running into issues. Like I would sit down, I'd write and write and write and write and write. And write. But invariably, I would write, 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 and then, oh, distracted. What? The Lakers might trade for who? What? You know, and I would be getting all distracted by all this Lakers stuff. And finally, it dawned on me. I'm like, man, you, you got to write what you love. You got to write what you love. And all of my free time I was spending just consuming, you know, there were message boards back then that was mm. consuming Lakers content. You know, there was club Lakers was a thing back, back then this message board. And so I'd be on there all the time. There's real GM, there's all that kind of stuff. Sure. And I'm going through all these news, all these rumors and stuff. Meanwhile, I'm reading Mark Stein, I'm reading Bill Simmons and 
And I'm like, man, you know, I don't have the connections these guys do, but I think I could, I think I could pull off this kind of writing. Mm, I think I could do this. And so not wanting to, not wanting to just jump into anything without knowing whether or not I, I was going to be able to stick with it or if my attention was going to be pulled elsewhere, like it was with, uh, with novel writing, I, uh, I started up a blog, um, which still exists as an artifact out there somewhere. Um, and I, and I just started writing, just started writing about the team. Uh, it got no views, no traffic or anything like that. I think I had like a couple hundred Twitter followers at the time, maybe. Um, and, uh, and so I used that after about six months, I went, yeah, you know, I really like this and I really think I can, I can do something like this on the side. And so I used the blog that I, uh, as a writing sample to pitch a few sites and say, Hey, look, here's what I can do. And uh, I got hired on somewhere. And when I say hired, I mean, I made zero money. There was no, it was just, hey, we'll give you a little bit of exposure. And uh, that eventually caught the, my work there eventually caught the attention of Lakers Nation. And they offered me a spot to to write one editorial per week. Um, and and I said, okay, let's go. And, uh, and that was eight years ago nine years ago now um it was a long time ago hmm. but um but yeah and then everything has grown from there so I, I initially came on i didn't start lakers nation some people think i started it or that i own it which is not not the case um but i came on board a long time ago writing one editorial per week that was my role and then things grew from there did you think um because I, I I think there's for me somebody that's in the space, and you know I'm obviously very familiar with what you guys are doing there on a night in night out basis. Did you think, I don't know, five years ago, were you thinking it could grow to this? It could this just take me through your mindset over the years, and are you not paying any attention to that? Are you just saying that you know what I'm just going to keep rolling up my sleeves, go to work, put us. Anytime something is, and we know in our space, things are time sensitive. So yeah. if you're not getting something up, you know, I, I watch a lot. Of, I consume a lot on YouTube and, you know, you see these people that have a food review or they went traveling and they, yeah. you know, caught that those live forever. Yep. Our world does not. Our world is if, it's if, the, the if the report on DeJounte Murray, you're lucky to have it for a couple of hours. Right. So I think that, um, I'm curious that when all this was kind of going and, and five years ago, four years ago, six years ago, did you ever think of, hey, this got the potential to be, and I don't think it's even close, the number one Laker platform of any platform out there? Um, it was on the on the website at the time. Lakers Nation was when I when I came on board. So that was obviously you know great. But from the 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 YouTube side was frankly kind of underutilized um, back then. Serena Winters, who's now with uh, the Cavaliers, killing it. She does, she's great. She does, yeah, she and she's fantastic. She does their their sideline stuff. Um, she was posting some of her stuff, but that was it was pretty much just the basic stand up type stuff, you know, in front of the court. And here's what happened in the game. And, and sure. that was it. It wasn't as much diving into like the news and the rumors and the cap analysis and stuff like that that I do. Um, so it was a very different feel for like the channel at the time. It wasn't necessarily a point of emphasis, and the Lakers Nation podcast didn't really exist. Um, so uh, years ago, did I think this would ever become like something that took up, I mean, more than a full time job's worth of, of time? No, I the the initial thought was this was always going to be something I was doing on the side. I was always going to teach, and I'd be doing this um, as a supplemental thing. And then this grew and grew and grew to this point. Um, you know, the the podcast itself, there had been a couple of iterations of the Lakers Nation podcast before I came along that they tried to get off the ground and just never really went. Um, and, and people were, you know, wasn't consistent or anything. And so I I raised my hand and said, hey, I would like to give this a try. And I was awful at it The when I first started. It was terrible. Um, they, they literally, when we go to like our team, we meet as a team, uh, all of Lakers nation every year we meet in Las Vegas for summer league and every year that's still good. How bad the first podcast was. I didn't know they played it for the whole staff. My Sam, my sample podcast, they played for the whole staff to listen to and critique. I had no idea they were going to do that. And it was terrible. I have, I believe at this point I have scrubbed it from existence. 
uh, because it was so bad. But they allowed me to to. Ju I just said I will put in the work and and try to make this thing grow as much as I can, and I will grow alongside with it. I will get better and better. I will put in all the work. You guys, you don't have to do anything. Just leave it to me. I will teach myself how to edit. I will teach figure yeah. out how to you know use a mic and do all this kind of stuff. And uh, fortunately, they gave me the platform to to do that, and uh, you know it it just it took off. But I wasn't expecting it to do what it's done. You know when we first started all this. All right, here's what I'm going to give you one piece of advice: one thousand percent, do not scrub that video. Keep it. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Oh, keep it's not it. even you know, video. It's it's audio only. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I I say that because I think we all I think about whatever somebody's. Uh, whatever their career is, right? Whatever it is that they're pursuing or they're doing, man, it's cool to look back. I even have, so when I initially, initially started doing the post game show officially for 710 ESPN, right? And this is somebody like you, right? It's kind of like a dream come true. Are you kidding me? I'm doing the post game right. show. And, I, and it wasn't, it wasn't even my, I was just filling in occasionally. I still have my notes of the notes that I was taking back. I think it was 2016. And, the names that are on there and everything else, but there's something about wanting to keep those forever because look, we all got to start somewhere. Sure. It's funny for me, YouTube, YouTube was my, um, YouTube was my platform to practice. So before I had any of those gigs on 710 ESPN, I was using YouTube. Just, it's almost like you were going into the gym and going into the gym for the first time and having absolutely no idea what that machine does how that might help you. By the way, I still don't know what any of those machines do in the gym. Just that's not my <laughs> it's not my expertise. But in a week, it's not going to be as intimidating to go into that gym. In a month, you might actually look like you know what you're doing by going from that machine to that machine and doing X amount of reps. In a year, you walk in like you own the place. And I think that's whatever it is the career that you're doing. But when you said that that audio was so bad, I would be very prideful of that audio, right? Because that was your that was your introduction to it. So that's that's yeah. a cool story. That's definitely a cool story. Okay, I got I got a couple more questions and then we're gonna talk Lakers basketball. And cool. I, I appreciate you spending the time and and kind of sharing your backstory to this. I think it's uh I think a lot of times people don't know, you know, us personally. Sure. And if they do, maybe they only get small little uh doses of it. So I think it's cool to 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 to, I'm learning about you, and I didn't know all this stuff about you, yet you and I are in touch on a weekly basis or whatever the case is. So um, you stream live after a game. Mm -hmm. That number says 4,000, 5,000, says 6,000, says 2,000. Do you ever stop for a second and say, I have 4,000 people, I have 5,000 people that are live streaming me right now? And for those who don't know, I mean, you could be talking about people that are, um, I don't even care what the space is. Those are monster numbers. Do you ever stop for a quick second and just say, I got people from all over the world that want to hear my opinion about the Los Angeles Lakers. Do you, do, do you catch yourself at any moment stopping and smelling the roses? It's uh yeah, it is a little surreal sometimes. Like I try not to think about what the number actually means. Um, when I see that, like when we do a video that does a hundred thousand views or something, um, I mean that's it, it blows me away to stop and think about how many people actually see our content, see what what we're doing, see you know the things that we're talking about. Um, I, I would think if I was face to face with all the people that are watching, you know, if it's like a really big game and we've got 10,000 people that are there at the same time, if I was at that moment sitting in front of 10,000 people, like well, that, that would be a little bit overwhelming. So the fact that, it's, that I'm just, just in front of the camera, um, I think that probably, probably helps a little bit, but it's, it's incredible. It's all inspiring. It just, it blows me away. And there's times here's where it, where it gets me, Alan. Okay. It's when, um, it's when I'm out and about and I'm someplace that I wouldn't expect it. Sure. And so and somebody says, Hey, I watch your stuff from Lakers Nation. Like for for example, we went on uh last year, we went on a cruise. Uh, my family and I. And it was a cruise out of uh out of New Orleans. So I flew to New Orleans mm -hmm. and then hopped on board this cruise ship because we were meeting my in-laws and, and stuff like that. So it was a cruise out of New Orleans, so nowhere near LA, anything like that. 
And I get on the cruise and like my second day on the cruise, I'm walking around and one of the guys on the cruise mm -hmm. comes running over to me and goes, and goes, Hey, you're, for, you're Trevor Lane. You're from Lakers nation. And he's all, he was all excited. Uh, he's one of the guys who works on the ship. He's from the Philippines and watches our, and watches our content. Right. I'm just like, I'm just like, man, we're getting people from like, from all over the, I've had people messaging me from Australia, from England, from Incredible. all over the place. And, uh, it's stuff like that, that really makes me see like what the reach is of this and how many people actually see, uh, what it is that we do. And it's just, it's so cool. It's so, it's so amazing. And it's something that I try not, uh, try not to take for granted. Yeah, that, that's, that's the 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 worldwide thing is what's crazy you know i i do yeah. something on my channel only when the lakers win trevor and so you could tell that that's below 50 percent of the time right now but i do something called roll call and mm -hmm. what's roll call roll call is hey tell me where you're tuning in from and you know initially however organically that happened it was more just it's like a chance to see this dude is in Athens. That person's in Italy. This person's in the Philippines. This yeah. person is, you know, in South Africa. It's like, what? Of course, you're going to get your people from LA. Of course, you're going to get sure. people from California and the States. But yeah, that that part, uh, that part is crazy. Um, okay. Uh, as far as family goes, you are married and a daughter as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, my daughter is okay. seven, um, awesome. and she is, uh, and she has actually jumped on some of our. We've done a, a channel membership over on Lakers Nation, and so she's actually made some cameo appearances on some yeah. of the only videos. She's jumped on. She's all excited about that. But uh, that's so cool. But yeah, um, so I, I'm married. I've got a, a seven-year-old daughter. Uh, I have pets, and they are all uh, Lakers-related names. Okay. Uh, Can my, I guess them? Can I guess how many? How many pets do you have? I have four. You have four. They're dogs or combination. I have, here? I have two dogs and okay. two cats, and the two cats are brothers. Two cats are brothers. Okay, so I'll guess the names. At least this is what I would have named my two um, dogs and my two uh, cats. Okay. Of course, Anthony Peeler. Um, that, that's a good guess. Yep, Lade. Of course, Lade's on Vlade. that list. <laughs> yep. Uh, Cayman. Okay. And um, the last one, Sacre. Did I get them? Did I get all four? That, that's that's pretty close. Cayman Cayman lays down a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so my my cats are okay. are Chick and Stu, which we named a. Boy oh, cat. that's awesome. So my, my cats are Chick and Stu. Okay. And then uh, our dogs are the boy is Baylor, uh, for Elgin Baylor, and then the girl is Harper for Ron Harper. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that chicken stew combination there. That's look right. at you. That's look right. at you. Now, unfortunately, they fight all the time. <laughs> they, they, they they battle each other. So um, so they're not too nice to each other. But but um, yeah, those are the cats. Um, okay, so I want to start talking um, Lakers basketball. Before I do, I want to give a shout out here. Um, and for those who are just kind of coming on here, and this is you know obviously like I mentioned, it's the first time I'm doing the podcast and for the podcast um this is something i'm doing on a weekly basis for now part of my idea my concept is i'm going to highlight a different nonprofit. and by the way if you have nonprofits out there that you would like for me to highlight feel free to do it if i don't have an actual sponsorship to the show a partnership on the show um i'm going to highlight nonprofits. so there is a nonprofit out of puerto rico and this is a friend of mine that actually runs the nonprofit. It's called techmyschool.org. And Trev, since you're in the teaching world and the teaching industry, at least that was your past. It's a really cool story of why he put it together. He was an international school, international teacher for years. And the concept is in Puerto Rico, they do not have the infrastructure nor the technology. I'm talking about computers, laptops, iPads. And his day-to-day -day is literally to try to find as best as he can, raise as much money as he can so he can improve uh, these schools that are out there and try as best as he can to get them the infrastructure that they need. So my buddy who's um, uh, doing this and making it happen, I wanted to highlight his nonprofit today. This is him right here, Robbie Cobbs, his wife, um, Irina Cobbs. So they've been running this company since 2021. I'm going to put a link in the description. If you'd like more information or you'd like to donate, techmyschool.org. 
obviously it goes to a great cause. So I just wanted to point that out. And I will continue, like I said, for any of these areas where there is not a Spartan sponsorship or a partnership, I'm going to be using that to um, highlight nonprofits. If you have a nonprofit that's important to you that you want me to highlight, put it in the comments and I'll do my best to integrate it into what I'm doing. Okay. Want to make sure that I got that out there. Uh, tech my school, like I mentioned. Um, we talked some Lakers basketball, Trev. What do you think? Talk a little, let's do it. Let's talk do it. a little it might, Lake it show. Might be, it might be painful right now, but but let's do it. <laughs> okay. That, that's, you know, I, I'm going to start off with let's. Yesterday was such a surprise and a shock to me. And, and I kept saying it in the post game show when I was doing mine that I'm such an idiot. Like, why would I think anything otherwise? Why would I be so, so shocked that the Lakers lost to the Brooklyn Nets? You go look at the NBA standings. The Lakers have 22 losses. The Brooklyn Nets have 24 losses. Can we stop pretending like the Lakers and the Nets are, and I know this is probably a little bit uh, brutal to say this, but they're not that far off from each other. So the fact that the Lakers can lose to the Brooklyn Nets should not be a shock or a surprise. They were coming off two good wins. Of course, we know the Thunder and the Dallas Mavericks. Walk me through. You're watching the Lakers game yesterday. We get to halftime. It's a six-point game, and I thought Brooklyn was very fortunate to only be down six by the time we got to halftime. Felt like mm -hmm. Lakers were up by a lot more. And then by the time the third quarter's done, Lakers are starting to get their asses kicked, and it really didn't change in the fourth quarter. How, how much of a shock was last night to you? Um, I, I'll tell you what. It was a little bit of a shock because they did have those two good wins uh, that felt like, okay, they've turned the corner. This is it. It was as though we, we thought they had woken up, right? They had finally woken up. They had been in this weird funk, this haze they had been in since the in-season tournament. And it was like we were finally seeing the team back to being who we expected them to be. And for the first quarter, they were back to being who we expected them to, to be, at least for most of it. They were making defensive plays. They were getting stops. They were uh, having fun in transition. They were getting great scoring opportunities, hitting shots. Double-digit lead at one yeah. point. Yep. It, it, looked, it looked good. And we thought, okay, cool. Yeah, you know, and it was just enough. Just enough, Alan, to make you take your guard down and to make you believe again. And then they smashed that right back to the ground. And my concern when they whenever they come out hot on the offensive end, my concern with this team, they there, there's this pattern that they fall into where when they're scoring the ball, they don't get stops. When they're not scoring the ball, they get stops. Um, so in the end, the, the result is you're just kind of tread water. You're not, you're not building a lead. You're not coming back into a game. Um, they tend to have a hard time getting stops and then getting scores consistently. Um, and, and when you see them scoring early on, my fear is always that they're going to fall into that trap of believing that the offense is going to keep coming. So if you don't get a stop on the other end, it's okay. Cause you're going to get it right back. The problem is this offense hasn't been good enough to do that. And the offense has looked better over the last week or so, but I always have the sense that it's the Lakers offense that's going to break first. That if you've got two to if it's the Lakers and their opponent and they're going head to head and both teams are hitting shots, it's the Lakers that are going to hit a slump first before the mm -hmm. opponent does. And that's going to be a problem. And I feel like that's kind of what happened against Brooklyn. The Lakers defense was not getting stops and Brooklyn got a lot of confidence. And the Lakers were never able to to get control of that again, and their offense never caught up. And part of it is, it, oh, there's a lot of reasons why. But um, for an emotional level, this was a gut punch for fans. This was a because fans had pretty much been like, okay, this team's bad. I'm not going to be invested in this team. Uh, they're they're not going to be any good. This is terrible. And then they won a couple of games, and people started going, okay, well, all right, wait, wait now, maybe they've figured it out. And you get your hopes up a little bit, and then to get hit by this, to lose to the Brooklyn Nets of all teams. This, I mean, this team lost twice in the last week and a half to the Blazers. Yep. That's that's the Brooklyn Nets. And um, to, so to drop a game to this team was uh, was a crusher, and it was more confirmation that, that this team is just not – they're not consistently good, that's for sure. They may, may just not be good, period. Yeah, I, I guess that was gonna that was gonna be my next question. So, where are you on the team? They're twenty one and twenty two. Um, uh, listen, can we make excuses? We can. We could talk about Lakers had some injuries early on, but sure. to be honest with you, the fact that LeBron and AD have played this many games, 
plus Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell. I mean, really, all four of those players have basically been available the entire season. Um, I, I think it's – I feel like I'm fooling myself to think that they're a real contender. I feel like I'm fooling myself to think that, you know, they just got this on switch that's going to come on and all of a sudden everything's going to change. And, yeah, maybe they can win two good games. They could beat Oklahoma City. They can beat Dallas. But – they're so inconsistent, wildly inconsistent. I have no idea what to expect on a night in, night out basis. I really, really thought Lakers were going to handle business over the weekend, and instead they get their asses kicked yesterday against Brooklyn. Just what's your overall thoughts on where the team is right now? Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of a mess right now because this, uh, this to me was confirmation that they just they can't be trusted to go out there and take care of business in a game that mm. they should, and. It's definitely got me concerned for what's going to happen in March and what's going to happen in April because the schedule gets much more difficult. The Lakers have, look, people will want to shout excuses and all that. The Lakers have a very difficult schedule. There's no there's no question. Now, that doesn't mean they should be where they're at right now. This doesn't mean that that's acceptable to be where they're at currently with the team that they've got. But uh, the reality is you've got wins are going to be hard to come by in March and in April. And so with that being the case, you have to stack up as many wins as you can right now. And they're not doing it. They're not doing it. They're not getting the job done. And I think that's just essentially what we're looking at for this season so far. We're just over the halfway point. And we could say this is a team that has not lived up to expectations. Yes, they won the in-season tournament, but they have not gotten the job done. They haven't gotten the results that they need. And so that obviously puts you into a bigger question ahead of the trade deadline. What what can this team ultimately be? There's still time to turn it around, but I mean, it's it, the clock is ticking here for them to for them to do something, and they need to figure it out and figure it out fast. Otherwise, this is going to be essentially a lost season. Okay, um, with that in mind, and there is no, you can't really have lost season when your best player or one of your best players obviously is at age 39 and, and everything you're always all in February 8th is a trade deadline. Um, we've heard rumors from a couple months ago about Zach Levine. The latest ones are DeJounte Murray. Um, Tyus Jones has been brought up and we we've heard some different names. I, I'm just curious how realistic, I, let me use as an example, Yovan Buha, we, we both know pretty well mm -hmm of the athletic reported that the Lakers had made an offer or there was, there was at least some details of what a, a, the infrastructure of a deal would look like with the Atlanta Hawks. I don't understand why the Hawks would take that deal. I understand why the Lakers would take that deal, but let, let's just, um, let's put that to the side for a quick second. What do you think should be the absolute priorities between now and the trade deadline? And, how desperate are the Lakers to try to put together a move or or how you think reserved they'll be because of the team that they may believe will eventually turn it around? Well, I, I think they need to be there needs to be urgency. I don't know if you want desperation in there. And that's frankly what I thought was going to help really with the trade deadline was the Lakers winning these games, winning against OKC, winning against Dallas. I thought they should beat. They were a heavy favorite uh, to beat the Nets. And then they and then drop that game. Rob Lincoln needs to be able to go into those negotiations and deal from not a position of desperation to be able to tell an opponent uh, or a trade partner that, hey, uh, if this deal is not to our liking, we don't have to do this. We're doing just fine. Look, we're starting to come back. Delo's hitting shots. We're winning games. Everything's mm. good. We're going to step away from this. Now, though, if you drop games like this, teams are going to go, oh, you have to do something. Otherwise, your season, your season is sunk. So uh, we'll take that 2029 first. We'll take, we'll take this. We'll take that. We'll take all the stuff in order to do a deal with you. You know nobody is going to be uh, jumping for joy to help the Lakers right now. So that's one of my concerns for the trade deadline. But I do think that they they need to do something. But, Alan, here's my key for all of this. you got to be really careful because I don't know when, but a post-LeBron era is coming. It, sure. could be as, it could be as soon as this summer. He has a player option this summer. It could be done this summer. So my big thing, and this is where I think DeJounte Murray actually fits, and there's some questions about does he fit on the court and all of that. But 
If you're going to surrender future assets, which that rumored deal, D'Angelo Russell, a 2029 first, that's definitely a future asset. Other draft capital, maybe Put a Jalen Shafino. Shafino, that's a that's future asset. If you're going to surrender future assets, what you want it to be is you want to kill two birds with one stone. You want to be able to get something that can help you help LeBron win right now. Sure. But also something that has a high probability of being able to flip down the road and maintain some flexibility. And that's where DeJounte Murray on a four-year contract, pretty team-friendly, I think. He's going to be making like $25 million once that extension kicks in. Great. Because what's going to happen is if, let's say this summer, two years from now, whenever, LeBron walks away, what if Anthony Davis decides to walk away as well? If he says, hey, I want to trade, you want to have these pieces that you can turn back into draft picks, turn back into future assets. What you don't want to do is give up your 29 first right now for Boyan Bogdanovich, right? Who's who's a fine player, no question, but you're not going to be able to retrade him down the road. You're going to get the last of his value on this team right now, and then it's done. So I think the key for the Lakers of the trade deadline, it's not just adding to the team right now. It's adding to the team while trying to get pieces that ideally you could retrade down the road if you hit a point where you need to do so because that's my concern is that you give up all your future asset assets now you get players that essentially their value expires on the team and then you're really in trouble a few years down mm -hmm. the road it's a difficult needle to thread but that i think is the way the lakers front office needs to approach this trade deadline well i, I think i'm going to play you another scenario what if dejounte murray is and, and this is a reason why I like Murray as well. I like him because he is 27 years old. Mm -hmm. I think he can be the third best player on a really good team. Um, and if that's short term where Braun is here, cool. But let's look a couple years from now. I still think he could be a great asset for the Lakers. Sure. It's not like, you know, at age 29 or 30, DeJounte will have lost a step or anything. You just hope that he's gained some knowledge. He's on the right team infrastructure to where they're helping him win. He obviously got his career started with Greg Popovich. He can also be a player where when Braun does decide to leave or retires or whatever the case is, yes, you have to replace Braun with another all-star, but DeJounte Murray could potentially be part of that trio with Braun. Mm -hmm. And then post-Braun, I'm not saying he becomes the second best player. I'm saying that you try to replace Braun with another player and, and DeJounte is still part of the mix. Um, it's interesting what they do, but I think you're right about you got a couple goals that you got to you have to accomplish. I mean, there really is no other team that's in a predicament like the Lakers because no other team has a 39 year old that's still this good. But you also have no idea what the next year, two years are going to look like. And even with him playing this good and AD playing this good, there's still a game below 500. So mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a little bit of a of a head scratcher right there. Um. Trev, my brother, I think uh, I think we accomplished what we were looking to accomplish today. Um, I, uh, I I really enjoyed this chat, this conversation. I think for me, um, getting a chance to get a little bit of a background of your upbringing, your how you became a Laker fan, how you got to Lakers Nation, and then obviously getting your opinion on Lakers basketball. That was uh, that was my goal today, and. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and, uh, and and hanging out here with me on the channel and uh, and talking some Lakers hoops and and getting a little bit inside uh, inside of your story in your life. Well, thanks, Alan. Thank you for having me on. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Okay, that's Trevor Lane. I don't need to tell you guys where to find him because everybody knows where to find him. Um, but Trevor, uh, thank you very much for doing it. We'll talk with you soon, Laker fans that are out there. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll uh, react to the Lakers and the Blazers. Trev, obviously, will be doing the same thing on Lakers Nation. So appreciate all you guys being a part of the show. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Enjoy that uh, NFL football, and we'll uh, get back to you guys tomorrow. Thanks, Lakers fans.